All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I know we still have some folks trickling in probably online and uh, on the lunch line as well. Um, I just wanted to welcome everybody to the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. My name is Tony Gardner, and I lead our Institute for Rebooting Social Media, and I'm delighted to be kicking off our fall speaker series. Uh, we have a very special guest today, Sasha Eisenberg, who will speak on his new book, The Lie Detectives, In Search of a Playbook for Winning Elections in the Disinformation Age. We'll leave some time at the end for questions from the audience, so please keep those questions. Um, and if you're online, you can drop your questions in the Q&A, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. I am delighted to introduce today's speakers. Sasha Eisenberg is a journalist and the author of four previous books, including The Victory Lab, The Secret Science of Winning Campaigns. He teaches the UCLA Department of Political Science and is a correspondent for Monocle and has written for the New York Times Magazine, Bloomberg Business Week, and Politico Magazine. Interviewing Sasha today is Rebooting Social Media Visiting Scholar Mio Jung Chung, an Assistant Professor of Journalism and Media Innovation at Northeastern University. Her primary research focuses on the intersection of digital media, misinformation, and policymaking. Welcome, and thank you both for being with us. Hi. Um, thank you, Mio. Thanks, Tony, for having me. Um, let me talk a little bit about how I got here and then we can uh, open up a conversation and hopefully get some of your questions. Um, uh, one of my earlier books that Tony mentioned, The Victory Lab, came out in, in 2012. And it was this book basically about innovations in, in uh, political campaigning, largely over the first decade of the century. Um, sort of like all these two strands of innovation, of, of the, all the data that had become available in campaigns to profile individual voters and the increased use of field experiments to measure what worked and what didn't. Um, and it was a largely optimistic, positive book about, about uh, innovation and technological transformation of, of political campaigns in the United States. Um, these innovations were being used to uh, help campaigns tailor their appeals to voters so they were more likely to send you mail on topics that they thought were of interest to you. Campaigns are using this to get better at, more efficient at registering and mobilizing voters. I think it's one reason that we've seen an uptick in voter participation in the last generation or so. Um, and my book barely mentioned the internet for a bunch of relatively boring reasons about how voter data is organized in the US. But the optimism with which I wrote about how campaigns were improving their door knocking tactics and their direct mail, I think was like largely of a piece with how we talked about the role that the internet was playing in, in campaigns then. Um, and so, you know, I think that was true in the US, not just in campaigns and politics defined very broadly, right? I mean, I think that was a story that came out of, of the Obama campaign of 2008. We talked about how, how um, uh, sort of early social media in particular was um, allowing people to to create and share uh, content on behalf of candidates. We marveled at how um, tools allowed people to make phone calls from their home without going into a, a phone bank or, or uh, print out a, a, a canvas walk list from their home printer instead of having to rely on political machines uh, or media organizations to sort of intermediate um, their participation in the process. Um, and it was a version of the story we told about, about politics internationally. I, mean, I think I sent my uh, that book to the printer the same month that the, um, the Arab Spring was beginning. Uh, um, and uh, some, you know, the, the sort of origin mythology of, of that is that you had, you know, one guy in, in Cairo who did not have run a have a control over a state-run media outlet, or a, had not uh, built a did not have a social organization or a political party under him, but he had a Twitter account and he could tweet, come down to Tahrir Square, and overnight, the type of social movement that might have taken years, if not decades, in the past to mobilize could could sort of organically appear. Um, 
And, you know, what I think became really apparent to me only uh, in 2016, and I think to many of us around that time, was that you lower the barriers to political participation and you get a whole lot of great outcomes. People can engage their neighbors and contribute meaningfully to political debates without having um, any particular you know, individual citizens can 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 contribute meaningfully. They can get better at mobilizing their their neighbors and organizing them. You can have social movements um, emerge against totalitarian governments that had previously shut off dissent. You also lower the barriers for political participation. You get a whole lot of people and institutions and organizations that um, all of a sudden can can communicate at, at the type of scope and scale with. Uh, uh, the electorate um, without any of the uh, accountability that traditionally accompany that, whether it's the accountability that's placed on, on candidates through campaign finance rules and, and disclosure, the uh, accountability that comes through speak communicating over the public airwaves, the accountability that comes through major media organizations being, you know, held accountable in courts and at least, you know, in the, in the public sphere um, through their subscribers and advertisers. Um, and so a lot of people all of a sudden were able to become major political communicators in our politics. And that meant that campaign debates were not just between candidates and parties and outside groups um, and media figures and organizations, but um, individuals who may or may not be anonymous, people who were um, playing in politics not because they particularly cared about a political outcome, because, but because they were enjoyed the sport of it or were making money off of advertising clicks or um, doing it for the lulls or were working outside the United States either for with economic objectives or for geopolitical objectives. and. So the, this book is sort of the result of, of um, perhaps my uh, recognition of the, the naivete of, of the previous book and, and my recognition that this is, was sort of the most interesting uh, frontier of, of campaigning innovation that I wanted to explore, which is how, how sort of what I would call legitimate political actors, um, campaigns, parties, outside groups like labor unions or super PACs that are operating under a whole bunch of constraints, some legal, some normative, uh, about um, how you communicate to voters are now in this sort of asymmetric environment where their their um, opposition is not their opponent. It's not necessarily another party or a candidate, um, but it's somebody who is not operating under those constraints and cannot be held accountable through the political, the, the traditional political mechanisms. And so um, this book is sort of my effort over, reported largely over the course of, of 2002, um, sorry, 2002, 2022, uh, to see how, you know, mostly in the United States, but I also have a chapter set in Brazil, people within political campaigns are, are navigating this and, and um, thinking about how and when to engage with, you know, what is sort of, at least on the cover of the book, broadly lumped together is disinformation. But but um, for an academic audience, we could we could break that down a little more because it, it doesn't necessarily describe everything that, that's going on there. Okay, thank you so much, Sasha, for uh, walking us through the book. Um, it's a delightful and very timely moment, opportunity to learn how political campaigns can manage um, disinformation and during the election period. So um, I'd like to as start with a couple of questions to warm things up, and then we can turn it over to the audience for more questions, both in this room and on Zoom. So my first question is about um, the content of the book, of course. So you studied how political campaigns like um, Biden's in 2020 have managed to um, build trust with voters amidst disinformation. So what were some of the key strategies that worked for them and how do you think they can be, those can be replicated in future elections, including the current one? 
Yeah, you know, so the main character in my book is a, is a woman named Jory Craig, who basically, um, after the 2016 election, became the first uh, real full-time counter-disinformation operative in American politics. She has a sort of remarkable origin story that I, I tell in greater length in the book, but she had never worked in American politics before. She, um, uh, at the point you meet her in the book, in, in the aftermath of the 2016 election, she's 25 years old. She'd been from Illinois. She was like a model UN nerd in, in high school. Um, one of the great revelations of reporting this book is that you can actually get college scholarships for excelling in model UN, and she did. Um, she was interna interested in international affairs, and, and after uh, graduating from uh, college, she ends up working for uh, a firm, a Democratic consulting firm in Washington that sort of through a quirk of its history has the largest overseas practice of any consulting firm. I, the, the firm's founder had, had done polling for, for Bill Clinton, but he also worked for Nelson Mandela and Tony Blair. And so this firm is doing politics on, on six continents. And she is a 22-year-old um, in her first job is hired as a digital strategist and gets sent immediately to Moldova where she's helping a parliamentary leader get on Facebook. And then she's sent to work for a, a party in Gabon and then in, in uh, uh, she's in the Philippines and in Panama and she's, during the 2016 election she's in the Bahamas working on a, uh, uh, an election campaign there. But after November 2016, all these folks, in, in particularly in the sort of Democratic Party, progressive uh, political ecosystem, are, are blindsided, as everybody was, blindsided by the outcome of the election. And there are obviously lots of different lines of inquiry about how uh, Trump won. But one of them focuses on all these things that happened online over the course of 2016 that nobody fully appreciated or contextualized at the time. And you had major figures in the Democratic Party organizations, at labor unions, other groups who are suddenly who run been involved in political campaigns for decades and are suddenly confronting a vocabulary that's entirely new to them, right? They're asking, you know, what are bots? What are trolls? Like, how do we like literally what are these things and how do we think about them in the context of all the other things we know campaigns uh, should be doing? And it turns out there's nobody in American politics who had any experience running campaigns in this environment before 2016. And so they all gradually find their way to this woman, Jory Craig. And the thing that she's, she's not worked in, she's never worked on a campaign in the United States, but what she's able to tell them is that she, a lot of these are not new things. You know, um, things that were novel intrusions into our politics in 2016, the, uh, uh, Persistence, you know, the foreign interference, something in large parts of the world that's taken for granted that, that foreign governments or, or business interests will attempt to influence governmental decisions in another country, sometimes very overtly. Um, the persistence of rumor or conspiracy theory, you can go through large parts of the world where it's taken for granted that that is a vector of, of, of uh, political information and opinion change. Um, the rise of partisan and ideological media, which was like a key part of our media landscape in the 19th century, largely disappeared from American politics in the 20th century um, in a way that's really anomalous among almost all of our peer countries. Um, seemed very, has seemed very new in, in the last few years. She had worked in places where these were all just taken for granted. They weren't thought of as these new internet things. They were, think, they were thought of as this is how a communications ecosystem works. There are going to be people from other countries that are trying to change opinions. People are going to get their opinions through word of mouth, and that's going to be. And she had guided candidates and office holders to make smart, tactical decisions about how and when you communicate in places where these were not um, uh, so colored by their novelty as to. Um, uh, as to make it difficult for people to, to, to sort of navigate them intelligently. And a lot of what she has done over the, the last eight years, she's gone on to, you know, she advised the Democratic National Committee and the, the Biden-Harris campaign in 2020, and, and in, some, in some form or another, every significant um, partisan or, or, or issue organization on, on, on the left or center left of American politics shows her influence is helping people understand when to respond and 
and how, and more importantly, when not to respond. Because the simple fact is that if you are a public figure or public institution, um, now, and this, I'm writing mostly about candidates and office holders, but this is true of companies or universities or sports teams or celebrities, people are going to say things about you that you don't like on the internet all day long. This is something that like, we all understand at a very basic level in its non-internet form. Like, it's, you know, you don't have to be a communications professional to understand that if you are the Boston Celtics or MIT or the mayor of Boston or like whatever else, people on park benches and on buses and at bars will say things about you that are critical, maybe false, maybe lacking proper context. Like this is the way the world works. But I think people in politics, journalists are still overcome by the novelty of, oh, there's people are, this is happening online. And nobody would think that MIT would go around to people in public parks that they overheard saying mean things about them and try to correct their misimpressions. You'd say that's insane. That's beneath the dignity of MIT. You might give people the impression that there's something there, right? And we have all this, all these reasons why responding to any lie that pops up on the internet is a bad idea, right? There's, there's the idea that you can draw more attention to it than it's already getting, especially if you are a prominent figure or institution or validating somebody who has less stature than you. Um, there's all this cognitive science that you know better than I do that, uh, that if you do not address or correct a misimpression in the right way, you can end up reinforcing it in the minds of people who are familiar with it. All the ways in which algorithms are designed to uh, reward engagement means that you can, if you are trying to respond to or correct something, you can end up um, helping spread it further. Um, and then the, the thing that is, you know, a little more amorphous is the sort of opportunity cost problem, which is that if you're a candidate for office, but any sort of public communicator, any moment you spend responding to whatever popped up online today is time that you are, capacity that you are not using to talk about the things that you want to be talking about to the audiences that you care about. And so, um, you know, 99% of the time, let's say, the correct answer is do not respond to it. Let's say 1% of the time, you do need to engage with it because it could have a, a dangerous influence on, on public opinion on the things you care about. And so it's my way of saying all of the sort of tactics and strategies are built around figuring out how to intelligently separate um, the small amount of disinformation online that is, I, I quote, um, uh, I write a bit about the Biden campaign in 2020, and they tried to differentiate what they called market-moving disinformation. They care basically about two things. One, is this gonna change, move the opinions of the small number of persuadable voters in the United States to make it more less likely that they vote for Joe Biden? Or two, is this going to uh, reach Biden supporters in a way that makes them less likely to give or volunteer or, or actively change their 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 behavior um, in a damaging way. And the way they thought about it, this was if it is not going to do either of two, those two things. And I, I quote Rob Flaherty, who was the uh, digital director of the campaign in in 2020, is now a deputy campaign manager. It says, you know, if it's not going to we only care about it if it's a 50 plus one problem. Is this standing between us and getting a majority, a plurality of the vote? If it's not, it might be a problem for society, might be a problem for government, but it's not a problem for us as a campaign. We're not here to like correct misimpressions and, and educate people for its own sake. And, and so I can talk a little bit more about what they did, but just for now, like, you know, it was all really focused on identifying that market moving disinformation and trying to figure out how you address it without falling to any of the pitfalls that I mentioned where you're ending up um, reinforcing it or promoting and spreading it. Um, so I think you read your, um, you read my mind because I was gonna ask about, you know, like when not to respond yeah. to disinformation or when to respond to disinformation. And very interesting part in your book was, um, there was a sentence saying that Craig was paid for, um, paid to tell politicians what not to do instead of what to do. And she was very unique in a way, like teaching people how to be patient in terms of responding to disinformation. So there was a very interesting part. And you mentioned that Biden's campaign was very strategic in knowing when not to respond to disinformation. 
Um, so my question was actually, I was going to frame this question in the context of the illusory truth effect, which is um, when people are repeatedly exposed to this information without any correction, um, then they tend to believe it, right? So you were actually earlier mentioned that, mentioning that. Um, so in that context, is there any specific example in the current election, um, current campaign, um, that you think that ties into the ideas in your book, which is like when not to respond to disinformation is actually more effective than engaging with it? Yeah, so let me walk you through what the Biden campaign did in 2020, because it's many of the same people who are now doing this for Kamala Harris, and I think they're, they're thinking about, about, uh, about this problem is, um, comes from the same place. So in the summer, so, so they, 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 there were these sort of two major paradigmatic uh, shifts that they, they wanted. One was this idea of like, let's really focus on market, what they call market moving disinformation, disregard the rest. And the other thing was um, what, what Flaherty described as a, to go from a, what he called a supply side mentality on disinformation to a demand side mentality. And the idea is basically that campaigns um, had I thought of disinformation in terms of discrete, in terms of content, right? That could be a, a discrete bits of content. And that could be a single lie or misstated fact. It could be a uh, 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 deep fake audio or video. It could be a whole conspiracy theory. But they were thinking of the problem as, you know, let's identify these things, let's track them, and then let's figure out when and where we actually, which is going to be a problem for us and when, when and where we intervene. Um, a demand side mentality, they thought, was let's think about what, uh, which of those are likely to stick in the minds of voters because they come to them with pre-existing susceptibility to that particular storyline, right? There are, you know, thousands of bits of disinformation that are created that either don't get traction or don't move public, people don't believe. They don't, they're, they, they, they're not sticky, right? And we obviously talk about the ones that do, but, um, and why not? Uh, some of that, some of that might be a distribution issue, but some of that is that there are, people don't, internalize them, adopt them. Um, and so the idea was that the, that the uh, bits of disinformation that were going to be potentially damaging to the Biden-Harris ticket were the ones that responded to pre-existing anxieties, concerns, doubts that voters had about <coughs> the candidates' or issues, and that um, instead of chasing and responding to the individual bits of disinformation as discrete bits of content, um, let's address the underlying anxieties or concerns of people so that they are less likely to accept them if, if they reach them. So the way that they did this was they, um, based on sort of social media, social media monitoring data that, that this woman, Jory Craig, and her team had put together, came up with a list of uh, viral storylines, basically, is probably the best catch-all term for them that were circulating, that were critical of Biden and Harris. Um, I'll specify, like, they called it disinformation. I may call it disinformation. Not all of these were completely inaccurate, but they were all things that the Biden campaign thought, thought was damaging to them, and they lumped them all together uh, in a way. The truth and falsity of them was sort of beside the point. Um, but, and they did a big survey of persuadable voters and asked um, basically three questions. One, are you familiar with this? Two, do you believe it? And three, does it make you uh, less likely to vote for, for Biden? And um, uh, they mapped this on a, they mapped all the responses on a grid where one axis was the, the reach of a storyline, how many people were, were familiar with it. And the other one was the impacts. How likely was it to change your opinion? And so, for example, the stuff about Hunter Biden and the alleged corruption, it had a lot of reach. We're now in the fall of, of 2020. So Trump has already been impeached for the first time over uh, the call with Zelensky in which he tried to, to dig up dirt and turn it into an investigation. So people have heard everything about Hunter Biden at this point. Um, and actually, a lot of people thought there might be some truth to it, but it, 
They did not in large numbers say that it would change their likelihood of voting for Biden. And the campaign did focus groups that revealed that they that these persuadable voters they did not see Biden as fundamentally motivated by financial gain. And so they might have they might have thought it was true about his son, but it didn't actually um, uh, change their core perception of, of Biden. But the stuff that the campaign called um, the Sleepy Joe narrative, and um, they, they use Trump's nicknames for things because they're actually sometimes pretty useful, um, you know, which is sort of the sort of collection of things related to his age and his physical condition and his mental acuity. Um, that stuff had reach. It also had potential impact. Voters were saying that that, that uh, might make them less likely to vote for Biden. And this that was not a secret, right, to anybody that Biden could have age concerns, he was going to be the oldest president, blah, blah, blah. But the way that the campaign's communications department had, until this point, dealt with it was they set up um, photo ops of Biden riding his bicycle, and they would have him, like, jog up the stairs to to Air Force One, or not Air Force One, the campaign plane at the time. Um, and focus groups revealed that this was, like, not addressing what voters were not worried that he would, like, fail to get his steps in in the White House. <laughs> The voters who said that they were open to, that, that this could make them less likely to vote for Biden, saw him as a fundamentally weak political figure. I think that probably a lot of this has to do with, he'd been defined as vice president, um, he had won that nomination in 2020, uh, in a big field of candidates, he was never the main character, he was never the focal point of attention, he was sort of the default consensus of a party. And the, the opinion research revealed People didn't really know what he believed, didn't really know what he cared about, didn't know what he was going to prioritize in office, and had a bunch of suspicions about who would really be calling the shots and making decisions, and what they and, and whether their agenda might be different than the way Biden was presenting himself. And so they were welcoming, inviting uh, all sorts of speculation about his physical and mental condition, but they weren't actually worried about his physical and mental condition. They they were worried about something that was was quite different. And so the campaign's response to that was um, they began placing ads, you know, up against search terms like Biden and senile, buying inventory on, on websites like Fox News and Breitbart um, that were promoting stories like this, places that I should note, you know, there have been active efforts among progressive activists to, to boycott. Um, uh, and but if you had gone, uh, if you had searched those terms or you'd gotten uh, a targeted uh, YouTube pre-roll ad, um, you would not likely have had any suspicion that this was the Biden campaign's effort to deal with the age stuff. It, you would have seen like the, the best testing ad for to respond to this that they found. Um, was a 15 second video uh, recorded from one of his speeches without any obvious editing that showed him like talking like I grew up in Scranton and I have middle class values and here's what I would do in office like the most banal seeming communication in no way dealing with his age or his his apparent fitness but they found that that actually best addressed the underlying anxieties of the voters who said that they were concerned about the age stuff because it was presumably him talking in a non-mediated way about what he cared about, what he would do, and what drove him. And so that is, I think, the way that in this campaign, certainly Democrats are thinking about how to respond. I think there's this, this natural tendency um, to go, why isn't she answering? They're saying that she's a, her dad's a Marxist philosopher. Why isn't, why isn't the campaign out explaining that he wasn't really a Marxist philosopher or whatever it is today? And, um, you know, you hear people say, it's political malpractice, they're letting these lies spread. And usually they are making a concerted decision based on some, uh, uh, some data and thought process that either this is not persuading the voters they care about. I think we have to like recognize that a lot of the lies, election related lies are, are, are you know, um, certainly if you're talking about this from the perspective of the Harris campaign now, are basically being created by Trump supporters to amuse other Trump supporters as a form of like folk art and community building, but um, are 
very rarely either jumping out of kind of insular community online to get in front of, of a small share of voters in the seven states whose opinions really matter at the moment. Um, or they are jumping on getting in front of those people and they're not actually on the issue that those people are going to vote on. Um, or the campaign has identified that, 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 that that might be a problem, but thinks that they have found a way to address it by um, identifying the, the sort of underlying catalyst of, of uh, the receptivity to that, not by addressing the content itself in a way that, that, that can promote or elevate it. Okay, I just realized time flies, so we have until 1.30, so I have a bunch of, more, a bunch of questions, but I just asked one more question and turn it over right. to the audience. So, um, in 2024, political campaigns are facing quite different landscape with AI um, okay. playing a larger role, so how do you see AI amplifying this information and how, uh, how can the candidates counter this? Yeah, so, you know, I think we've all heard or seen or speculated on the the like nightmare scenarios with with AI. Um, I'll throw in a few notes of caution on that. I think the same underlying dynamics apply, which is we should be. I, I think there. I think the danger almost always, and this isn't you know this isn't just true with AI. It was true with when we were all obsessed with bots five years ago, and then when we were obsessed with trolls seven years ago, um, that if we focus too much on the distribution networks or channels or the tools that people use to create disinformation, um, basically on the supply side, um, we are losing sight of the real issue, which is why is a significant percentage of our population um, uh, basically gullible? susceptible, and why are certain ones of these able to catch on and other ones aren't? And I think that it's, it's too much of the focus on, on how is it made or what tools were behind this um, uh, almost always serves as a distraction from, from uh, thinking about that, that core durable issue, which, which really is a concern. Um, the, you know, I would note that the, I would argue there have been like three conspiracy theories that have dramatically shaped our politics in the last um, six, seven, eight years, you know, not just individual falsehoods, but totalizing conspiracy theories, right? With QAnon, the COVID vaccine related stuff, and then the 2020 election denial, skepticism, whatever we're calling it. Um, none of those had high tech deceptions behind them in the least, right? QAnon was literally the lowest tech thing that's ever been, I mean, it could have been done in like 1981. Like it was text on a, on a bulletin board. Um, and yet there were, it responded to pre-existing concerns that people had about the safety of their children, about, about sexual predators, about, about unaccountable powerful people. It told a compelling story. Um, people latched onto it. Um, there wasn't a single fake anything nothing um it was just text but it was a compelling story covid related stuff we had this amazing disruption in our lives people were incredibly disoriented they had existing suspicions of pharmaceutical companies not undeserved of you know that their esteem for for scientific expertise and governmental institutions had diminished over the years and um were presented a compelling story that um, nobody ever had to fake a, you know, deep fake Eli Lilly drug trial to convince people that the COVID vaccines were whatever, or it was a compelling storytelling exercise. And and then I'd look at what happened after the 2020 election, which was largely promoted by one guy in front of a television camera and a microphone. Um, and, and so I think that it, is in certain ways a lot easier to act like this is a tech, new technology is the problem when it, I think, is largely a distraction from dealing with the, 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 the far trickier issue here, which is, you know, why are, why are people ready to believe this and how do you address that in a, in a, in a broader cultural way? 
Now we have about 20 minutes, actually 19 minutes. So let's open the floor um, for questions. So please raise your hand uh, and the mic will come to you. And um, I ask you to do us a favor. When you're asking a question, uh, please introduce yourself briefly so that we can know who's asking these fantastic questions. Thank you again for this. This is really interesting. My name is Don Doak. I'm a Weatherhead Practitioner Fellow. Um, I'm with the FBI. I run Malign Foreign Influence and Disinformation Investigations. So this is a great talk. Um, so my question is about uh, when campaigns receive disinformation, what they believe to be disinformation, do they do their own diagnostics to determine origin? And if so, how, how does that play out in, in their strategy? Yeah, great question. Um, so. I think that there was, you know, so my book is like largely from the 2016 to 2024 era. There was a lot of attention in immediately after 2016 on um, uh, on attribution, tracing stuff back, uh, and increasingly campaigns are realizing that it is beside the point to the kind of tactical responses, whether or not people were fixated in 2017, 2018. 2019, is this a foreign, does this originate abroad? Is this a government behind it? And ultimately, if you're a candidate, it almost doesn't matter whether this is came from Russia or it came from Utah, whether if it came from Russia, this was done through the government, you know, with the government's overt blessing or not. Um, and, you know, one of the big, uh, and I, and I would sort of lump the attribution thing in with, from the perspective of campaigns, obviously from a national security perspective, there's huge importance in identifying that. But I do think from a, a, a from the perspective of campaigns deciding how do we respond to it, um, there, uh, it's not unlike focusing on the technology by which it was made or how it was disseminated, which is you're getting away from the, the core thing that you have to worry about, which is like, our opinion is going to be that we care about going to be changed because of this. Um, and I do think that is a, a you know, there, uh, one of the big hurdles here for um, political decision makers, you know, uh, talk about that, you know, having to decide when not to respond. And it is a difficult decision because people bring so much baggage to this that is not just about effectiveness or efficiency. And so I, I write about the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, which after, um, starting in 2019, developed this counter disinformation task force. I have this scene where the chair uh, woman of the, the campaign committee, Sherry Bustos, is hosting these dinners for, for um, Democratic House members, where she's bringing in like members of her team to talk about what they're doing. And so the first one she has is she brings in the, the two uh, guys who are gonna run this counter disinformation task force because to dinner with politicians, they all get to go around the table and talk first. Um, and they're asked, why is this important to you? And you realize pretty quickly, this is a very different conversation they're having than if she had brought in the people who are running their their field organization or their uh, uh, you know opposition research program or their small dollar fundraising. Members start um, uh, talking about how their family members are getting death threats, or you have members who are on the intelligence committees who are getting briefings about the national security implications of this, and they are all motivated to act. There's this, there's this sense that, you know, we need, this is a, a threat to me or my family members, a threat to the country, we need to do something. And in purely electoral calculations, you should probably not do something most of the time. And that I think is really difficult for people to get their heads around is, is because often we're dealing with politicians who are wearing two separate hats and what you think is the right thing to do for the country, for education of the citizenry is often not the right thing to do, do tactically for campaigns. And I think the focus on attribution is, is a, a big part of that. Hi, uh, Brian Freeberg, Social Anthropology and the uh, Shorenstein Center. Uh, absolutely love this book and highly recommend everyone actually read this. You lay out a really challenging history about some mistakes that were made potentially in the academic, practitioner, and journalistic sphere about 
how disinformation was dealt with as a political topic. Would love to hear a little bit more thoughts about that. Anything in particular? New knowledge. Oh, yeah. So um, there's so there's this period in, in post-2016 where folks on the, on the left are, this is all entirely new to everybody, and, and Democrats are working through in real time, like, what should, how should we navigate this environment? And you have this, um, and basically everything is on the, on the table, on the menu, whatever. Um, you end up with a special election in, in Alabama in, in 2017. This is going to sound like ancient history. It was only six and a half years ago. But there was a guy named Jeff Sessions. He used to be in the Senate. He became attorney general. There was a special election. There's a guy named Roy Moore, right, coming back. Okay, we've been through a lot yeah, since yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, there's a special election. It's the first real... Uh, national election after after Trump wins, and so it becomes this proving ground for Democrats to test all their new ideas about how to campaign in the post-Trump era. And um, among the many sort of digital like pop-up startups that, that that play in Alabama are these two separate efforts to create false flag operations um, uh, targeting or aimed at um, diminishing support for for Roy Moore. One of them is uh, uh, designed, uh, run by some former Obama world digital people, um, designed to make it look like Russian uh, bots are following Roy Moore in mass to give the impression that he is being supported by by um, by Russian uh, by the Russian government. The other um, that is uh, launched by a local progressive sort of activist is um, uh, more fun by my by my lights. Um, he creates a fake uh, pro temperance prohibition group called Dry Alabama that exists only on Facebook, but uh, <laughs> gives the impression that it is a grassroots group designed to uh, ban alcohol in in Alabama. Um, and buys uh, Facebook ads aimed at uh, basically moderate kind of country club Republican types. These are the types of people who would probably be already ambivalent about Roy Moore, probably like a you know a mint julep or whatever, and um, uh, and puts out stuff suggesting that the Scoop Dry Alabama is is supporting Roy Moore uh, to create an association in their minds. Both of these are, are totally baseless organizations have been set up. Uh, relatively small amounts of money are, are, um, are, are put behind them. It takes about a year for the full story of these things to be unearthed by, by journalists. And it turns out that, that Reed Hoffman, the, the founder of LinkedIn, whose name is somewhere in this building as it is just spread everywhere, um, who at that point is emerging as one of the biggest donors in, in, in progressive politics, uh, has given a uh, hundred a hundred thousand of his dollars have ended up in each of these groups, um, and uh, we're now a year later in 2018 when it's disclosed, and he's hit not unreasonably with charges of hypocrisy. He's spoken in very high-minded ways about about Trump as a disinformation threat and. Um, the instinctive response, which is basically a a PR response is to put out a statement saying, um, this crossed the line, uh, I don't want any of my money going to this ever again. And because at that point, basically everybody on the American left is either getting money from Reed Hoffman or wants to get money from <laughs> Reed Hoffman, he writes a moral code around this that has become the basically the de facto position of, of um, the Democratic Party and its sort of allied organizations since, um, which is, you know, that um, they should not be creating or promoting disinformation. Um, and you can find a lot of people who work in democratic politics who will say to you, off the record or not for attribution, like, why aren't we fighting fire with fire? Like, we see all these tools. And in trying to understand why there has not been a large scale effort um, uh, to why we still have a sort of asymmetry between the two sides and not, um, as best I can tell, any 
sort of concerted, organized, funded effort to promote or dis uh, create, promote, disseminate disinformation on the American left against its political opponents. The best I can do is trace it to the way that that drew a line where none had previously existed about the propriety of, of, of this. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, Dimitri Courant, I'm a researcher at the Ash Center over at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question was about the, um, your last point uh, when you made the talk about why do people believe things and you mentioned something. Uh, I don't know if you had further ideas and if there is further idea about that in the book, but for me the example you took is maybe because there is parts of elements of uncertainty there. Like, so for the COVID it was, there is still the discussion between uh, so several community and the FBI was like, where does it come from? Is it engineered? Is it natural? And there is the controversy is still not over after years. So I guess there was a suspicion of a lie there. Uh, and for the Hunter Biden, well, there is trial at the moment. Uh, for the for the QAnon, I guess you could connect that to the Epstein scandal and the fact that uh, well, oh, he killed himself in the jail and oh, the cameras are off and all the you know. So I guess uh, for a lie to be really efficient and durable. Uh, in the in the strongest sense and a big one, there needs to be some element where there is uncertainty and there is a part of, of doubt. Uh, and I guess uh, if you had any idea about how to do that, how to like really fight uh, misinformation with like really investigation. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert on the psychology of, of, of belief in conspiracy, but I, I do think that you look at what, what has stuck and there are all places where you often have complex systems. Look, our, our electoral system in the United States is incredibly complex, including compared to other countries. We have a decentralized election system. In this state alone, there are 220 town clerks who run their own elections, um, uh, who feed up numbers through state officials. Every state and sometimes county to county have totally different rules and protocols about what machines they use. I mean, this is not something that your average civilian should feel like, oh, wow, I fully understand how votes are <laughs> cast and counted in the United States. And we've had a, you know, why have we throughout the 20th century had, um, in a way that would shock 19th century Americans, mind you, how did we end up in a point where by the late 20th century, other countries were asking the United States to send, this is now wild to say in 2024, to send our people over to be observers, to speak to the credibility of their election process. We had a bunch of institutions that um, uh, were held in relatively high social esteem that vouched for the fact that this complex system um, was solid and accurate and reliable. And most of those institutions are in lower esteem now than they were a generation or two ago. Governmental authorities, law enforcement, scientific, not really relevant to the, um, but people who would, the types of people who might say the machines are unhackable now or are held in lower public esteem, the media organizations that would tell people that this is a credible process, you know, um, are all, so I think some part of this is the, you know, the weakening institutional fabric of, of the United States, but then the subjects of the conspiracy theories, yeah, they're all places where, you know, people should have reasonable questions about what the hell an mRNA vaccine is. Like I did, and I read a bunch of explainers in newspapers. I still don't really understand what it is because I don't know anything about like real science. Um, I can sort of fake it through social science, but not real science. And um, uh, and so in the face of these sort of complex, incomprehensible systems, you're left with like one of two choices. One, you either believe experts or ins and or institutions that, that, that vouch for them, or you come up, accept some story that is comforting in some way. And, and there is a certain comfort to, you know, uh, to conspiracy theories. Um, they make sense of a complex world. And, and you know, I, but I think that, so I think if you're thinking about how to address them, you have to, one, think the very long-term process of like reestablishing institutional credibility, which is easier said than done. Um, but also try to isolate what it is about these particular spheres of human experience that lead people to be uncertain about how they work and are there basic forms of education or literacy that can take away the mystery, basically 
can you can you fill in the void onto which people are projecting conspiracy theories with with some form of, of accessible knowledge would be my guess. Hi, my name is Ron New, and I'm local resident. And wondering if you wanted to talk about the Harris Walls campaign's response to the disinformation that was amplified on national TV by uh, the former president regarding the practices of immigrants in a certain city in Ohio. Yeah, I mean, my guess would be not having spoken to anybody in the campaign about that specifically would be that they have a clear strategic determination that every day that this campaign is about immigration um, is not a winner for them. And if you, I, I can guess what the conversations were among her communications and digital team two weeks, a week and a half ago when this stuff was brewing, which is, yeah, we could say Trump and Vance are liars and they're reckless, um, but we are only making the campaign that day about the thing that they want the campaign to be about. I mean, I, I'm somebody who's wary of, of projecting, you know, strategic genius onto whatever comes out of Trump's mouth. <laughs> I think there is, he has a certain like instinctive tactical sense for drive driving attention to the things he wants to drive attention to. And Vance is just, I think, clearly more calculating and they realize that, you know, he went on and did a bunch of Sunday shows knowing he would get beat up on this and dragged it on and on because they realized that, that you're, it's just a agenda setting mechanism. This isn't like novel, but, but you have new, you have new tools with which to do it. And, and so, yeah, I, I think that the Harris walls campaign would have, I cannot imagine a world in which it is to their advantage, even if it's, it seems like they're getting one over on Trump, or walls by, you know, showing that they're liars. That the, that the, the benefit of that is way offset by the cost of, of dragging on a story about, about immigration when they want it to be about, about abortion, let's say, on a given day. And my guess is, though, if you found Trump or Vance lying about abortion in a way that the, that the Harris campaign thought would turn the conversation to an issue of their interest, they would be all over it. So we have a final question um, online and from Daniel, who sort of prefaces, you know, we're talking about this uh, from a domestic political, political campaign framework um, and asks if we go up to, uh, if, excuse me, if we go up a level to the cognitive warfare level versus adversaries like Russia, China, and Iran, are we losing that war? beyond my remit, unfortunately. <laughs> or fortunately. <laughs> it's a big question. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank well, you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Sasha and Neil. Thank you all for your great questions. Um, I hope to see you all again. Um, we just recently announced our full series, and we have a few other announcements up our sleeves, so keep an eye out for that. You can learn more on rebootingsocialmedia.org um, and also encourage you all to follow us on socials and on our newsletter. Um, also for the students in the room, we have some RA positions currently available. Um, you can also find that on our website and we'd be happy to chat with you about those right outside. Thanks so much.